so this is a talk about a build system called Bazel. Incidentally, one can use Python. Uh, as you can see, I've demoted Python to being uh, in parentheses in, in the title of my talk because uh, a lot of the talk is really about uh, general build system principles rather than just Python. Uh, so as I said, and as what's in the title, uh, this is about a build system called Bazel. Uh, so let me explain a little bit of the history of, of Bazel. So if you've ever worked at Google, uh, you'll know what Blaze is. Uh, I've never worked at Google, uh, but I've known enough ex-Googlers to uh, be able to piece together some of the, the story of Blaze. So long ago, uh, Google, which is mo a lot of their uh, internal code is C++, uh, they were using make files to compile their C++, uh, and they didn't really like manually writing make files, so they had Python scripts which generated make files to build their C++. That became unsustainable rather quickly uh, when you have hundreds of thousands of C++ files, you end up with make files which are uh, many megabytes long when they've been generated, uh, which is uh, not really what make was designed with, um, uh, sort of a Unix tool from the 70s. Uh, so they introduced something, they wrote their own build system called Blaze, uh, and it's now one of the core work, uh, tools used by pretty much every developer at Google. And as people left Google, uh, nothing really in the open source or even a proprietary product uh, existed which you could buy, which was like Blaze, and said, Google, will you please open source Blaze? And Google said no. Uh, so now there's these other tools uh, called Pants and Buck, which are very similar to uh, Blaze and were written by ex-Googlers. But just last year, uh, Google finally came around and they open source Blaze, and now it's called Bazel in the open source version, which is, of course, an anagram of Bazel, or Blaze. Uh, it's also a delicious herb which you can uh, put into pasta. It's not a completely open source project, maybe like a quasi open source project so far. Uh, so the main, the main source code of, of Bazel is still internal in Google, and then they mirror the commits into an open source repo. Uh, but they, they say it's on their roadmap for the open source GitHub repo to be the canonical one uh, inside Google too. To sort of introduce you in, to the concepts of Bazel and how, how we can look at how it's a little different than more traditional build systems like Make, uh, I have a little simple example, and you'll have to forgive me, uh, it's going to be with C++. Uh, so I have this little directory structure. Uh, we're going to be making a program which prints Hello Benjamin, uh, and it's going to be hyper-generalized, so I can make some points about build systems. So there's, the main program is this program called uh, hello.cc, and that depends on a library called uh, greeting.cc, uh, which has a header file uh, called uh, greeting.hh. And so we're going to have a make file, and we're gonna, also going to have this all cap build file, which is the rule definitions for Bazel. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and look at the uh, program. This is the uh, greeting library, and it just has one function, which uh, takes a name to greet, and in the arcane contortions of uh, C++ prints that to a uh, standard out. And then and we have more boilerplate in the header file, which just defines the prototype for the greet function. Uh, and so the actual program we're going to run is this little program which has a main function, so it depends on the greeting library, it includes this header file, uh, it just calls greet Benjamin. So the result of this is it will print uh, hello Benjamin. Uh, and so how do we uh, build this with a make file? Uh, so we're going to have a library, libgreeting, um, which is uh, a static library in this case, and then the program we're actually going to build is, is hello, so this is how we define this in make. And it says that hello depends on the library and the library's header and also the actual source file for the binary. And so then the actual commands we run to build these things are arcane and it took me 15 minutes to remember how to invoke AR to make static libraries, uh, et cetera. Uh, but let's just ignore that. Uh, so if we know how to use make to build a hello target. We just type make hello. So then make invokes all the commands to build the static library and build the binary. And now we have the hello program. We run it and uh, it does what we expect. Great. Uh, so now let's go look at the uh, Bazel build file. Uh, so as you can see, the syntax is quite a bit different than 
make files. Uh, so this is a Bazel rule definition for a C++ library. Uh, so it actually looks like we're invoking a function. And in fact, build files are a, a very restricted subset of Python. Uh, it's a language called Skylark. This C++ library rule has a name called greeting lib. And then we say this, there's only one uh, source file contained in this library called greeting.cc. Uh, and then we also declare the interface of the, the library, which is the header file. And then we're going to have another rule to actually generate the binary. So this rule definition causes us to generate a binary with the, which expects a main function to be in hello.cc. And then the interesting part is that it depends on the greedy library. Uh, so this is, this is something called target syntax. And, it and the colon causes it to basically be relative to the, the current build file. So this references this uh, C++ library rule, which we defined here, called greedy lib. Bazel will figure out how to uh, build this and link it into the library. So how do we invoke this with Bazel? It's, it's not so different from make. Uh, we use the Bazel build command and build the hello target. So Bazel will print out that it found that, it's happy with that, it'll run the commands. Uh, it doesn't actually print them out. Uh, and then it says, okay, I built your library and it's in this directory called Bazel bin slash hello. Uh, so we go ahead and invoke that, and just like the one we built with make, we've, we've managed to successfully build the binary. We've seen that Bazel has kind of a, a different syntax for defining build rules, uh, but, but it, it, and we don't have to like actually write out what flags to pass to GCC, uh, so it's a little higher level, but uh, it doesn't seem to be fundamentally different uh, from make quite yet. Uh, but I would like to make a small change to my make file in Bazel, and so we can see how one of the main differences. Uh, so what happens if I, re, if I break the dependencies in my make file? That is, I, in this case, I'm going to remove a dependency of my hello target um, and without changing the code and seeing what happens with make. So I'm just going to delete greeting.hh. So I include that, so I definitely depend on it, uh, but I'm going to not include it in my make file here. Uh, so I can remove that, uh, and then I can run make hello, make is going to decide that nothing has to be done because uh, all the modified times of my dependencies are older than my target, and then running hello still works. Uh, so what happens if I do the equivalent thing with Bazel? So in the equivalent thing with Bazel is I'm just going to remove this dependency line from the, the CC binary rule for my main program. So if I do that, and then I try to build my target again, Bazel is not going to be happy. Uh, it's it's going to say, oh, look, you, your C++ program uh, included this, this file called greeting.hh, but I can't actually see that you uh, depend on a rule which has a file called greeting.hh, so uh, your build rules must be unsound. In this trivial example, it's obviously not too hard to have a, a make file with correct dependencies, but the correct make files are very difficult to write uh, for non-trivial programs, and even if you manage to get it right once, then someone else will break it later when they, when they change includes or, or they refactor the make file. Uh, that's one of the problems which make has, but uh, make is a system which has is, which is kind of been showing its age and has some problems. Uh, one of the main ones is that it's, it's based on modified times. So modified times in make are basically used as a proxy for, has this file changed since I built something and do I need to do a rebuild? Uh, the problem with that is that Modified times don't, al don't always uh, do that correctly. For example, if your file system has uh, poor granularity, like many Windows file systems um, only have one second granularity, and it's very easy to uh, run a build and then make a change, and then the modified times are the same to the file st system. There's also problems where if uh, someone sets the clock back on the, the computer, then the, then the file system m times might be uh, uh, out of order. Um, and as we've seen, there's no verification of dependencies in make, so it's, it's easy to correct, write incorrect make rules which cause incremental builds to fail. Uh, and also, uh, as I alluded to, as Google found out, it's, it may can be very un, unscalable if you, when you have many, many uh, files and targets. Uh, and then the, the last thing is that make ideally encodes this dependency information of about your programs and libraries, uh, but there's no way to extract that information, even though uh, it might be kind of interesting to know. Like, is there a way, if I have some file, like, wouldn't it be interesting to be able to know who exactly depends on it? 
Uh, so Basil addresses most of these problems. Um, uh, and sort of the fundamental idea, which is, I think, both the most powerful and the most limiting idea of Basil, is that your build steps should be pure functions. Your build steps should declare all their inputs up front, and they should be deterministic functions of those inputs. And then they should and produce a few outputs. Uh, so in the case of C++, uh, that means your inputs are most obviously your source files, uh, but it also includes things like headers, which you depend on, uh, versions of the tool chain, like the compiler and the linker, uh, what flags you pass to the compiler, and um, what versions of like of uh, runtime things like libc you're linking to. And so the build function in this case is gcc. The way it's normally used is very much uh, sort of not, not a pure function. Uh, you, you have to do a lot of workarounds. You have to pass deterministic random seeds to gcc to get it to work and not include standard uh, things in your library path. Because if you think about it, if you just run gcc um, normally, like, Almost your entire system is basically an input to the function because uh, the standard system header and library paths get included. And so um, if you actually go ahead and declare all these things, um, you, can, you can make GCC deterministic, uh, and it probably generates a, an, an object file. Uh, so a build step, which is deterministic uh, and a pure function of its inputs and declares all its inputs, is said to be hermetic. Uh, so what does... Uh, what does hermetic build steps give us? Uh, well, one thing is perfect incrementality. If you have uh, a chain of these um, hermetic build steps, then you can create a dependency graph, a directed acyclic graph, and then once you've built something and you have this graph in memory and you decide uh, one file, for example, has changed, then you sort of set, you can make that part of the graph dirty and then um, propagate the, the change up the, the graph. And since all of your build steps um, are hermetic, you know that if uh, there's not a, a dependency uh, on the thing which is dirty, you know the other build steps cannot be affected. Another thing is it allows you to safely do things like distributed building and caching. If I have a hermetic build step, I know that if I have all my inputs, and I send them to a remote server, first of all, the build step won't depend on anything which I didn't send, and also it'll be, I'll get exactly the same thing as if I built it locally. Another important and obvious consequence of this is, is reproducible builds. Uh, so the thing which I build locally and the thing which my test server builds and the thing which I build to deploy production are all the same, uh, which is more reassuring. And as we've seen uh, with my simple C++ example, we're able to discover uh, dependency bugs and, and have a canonical encoding of the dependency graph of our program. Uh, so let's talk about Python. We're at a Python conference. So I'm going to do have the same thing in Python. We're going to have the hello.py and the greeting.py library, and we're going to have a build file, and we're not going to worry about make files, much less boilerplate than C++. So greeting.py, of course, just defines a greet function, uh, which prints out hello of whatever argument you to whatever argument passed to it. Uh, it's 2016, so we use print function. Uh, and then hello.py just imports from the greeting library and, and greets me. How do we express this Python program in, term, in Bazel terms? Uh, so here's what our build file looks like. You can see it's actually quite analogous to the C++ one. Uh, so we define a Python library uh, called greeting, which has greeting.py as a source file. Uh, no header files to worry about. And then we have a, a pi binary, which has um, the main, main functions in hello.py. Uh, and then it, the only source file is hello.py. In theory, we could have more files in our, in our binary. Uh, and then, it, again, we de declare a dependency on the greeting library with this relative target syntax. Uh, what happens when we actually try to build this? OK, so we run Bazel build hello. That prints a bunch of things which I've elided. Uh, and then we get another, just like the C++ program, we get another executable uh, in Bazel bin called hello. Uh, and if we go ahead and run it, we see that we've managed to build a, a functioning application. Uh, so let's dive in and 
uh, really look at what Bazel has done. Uh, so if we look in Bazel bin, uh, we see there's the uh, hello executable, and then there's this directory called hello.runfiles. The first thing we're going to do is we, we sort of like run less on, on the hello executable, and we see this uh, wrapper script, which uh, came somewhere from the innards of Bazel, like we never saw the source code before. Uh, and it seems to be uh, invoking something from hello.runfiles. Uh, so if we go look in hello.runfiles, uh, we see uh, our familiar source code. Hello.py is just uh, our, the executable program we made, and greeting.py is, is our unchanged library. Basically what the wrapper script does is it looks in hello.runfiles and runs hello.py, which then imports uh, greeting.py, uh, and, and is able to execute the greet function. What has Bazel done for us here? Well, basically, it's taken our, ex, our Python binary code, uh, binary in quotes, uh, and all of its transitive dependencies and put it into this run files directory. So, well, so we sort of have uh, a package in a way. So what happens is if, if I take this hello wrapper script and this hello to run files directory and I zip it up, and I send it to a server which has never seen any of this source code before, but it has a Python interpreter, then I can just run hello, and it finds the run files, and it has all the dependencies. Uh, so I've created a package contains all of its dependencies uh, hermetically. Uh, and so this is really useful for, for deployment. Uh, one of my other favorite features about Bazel is query. So when I was talking about make, I mentioned that uh, there's no way to get information which you've encoded in make out of it, uh, even though it might be interesting. But Bazel has a way for you to query the dependency graph which you've created. Uh, and so this is obviously most interesting when you have thousands and thousands of files and thousands and thousands of targets. Uh, but we can see sort of some simple things you can do with our trivial example. It has its own little query language. In my first example here, I can say, what are, the, what are all the things which the hello program depends on? So if I run Bazel query depths of hello, then I see, uh, OK, it depends on the greeting target, which is, an, which is sort of an uh, abstract thing. But it also depends on the greeting.py file and the hello.py file. That makes sense. Uh, and Maybe I want to just want to find all the dependencies which are source files, not the, not the greedy library target. Then I can just uh, filter out uh, everything which is a source file using the kind filter. And obviously, this is much more interesting when you have uh, thousands and thousands of, of files and many and transit dependency trees, which are very deep. And it can get quite sophisticated. Like this is a, uh, some Bazel queries from the, from the documentation. This finds all of the C++ libraries, um, which are dependencies of rules whose names end with test uh, in, in the foo subtree, um, except the ones which are dependencies of foo bin. Kind of nonsense, but you can, you can imagine the sort of sophisticated things you can do with this. Uh, another one which I really like is, if you know that something depends on something else, but you don't know how because the, the, the transitive dependency tree is really big, then you can use this, function, this query function called sumpath, uh, which tells you um, how to get from uh, one node in the dependency tree to the other. The final thing I wanted to touch on was some of the limitations of, of Bazel. Bazel gains a lot of its power, as I said, from having hermetic build steps, requiring build steps to be uh, pure functions and declare all their inputs. Almost nothing non-trivial which you have in your current build system is like that. Uh, sort of the, the canonical way of, of, of building source code, uh, especially on Unix, like you run the configure script and then you run make, uh, just is not very compatible with this because it, it, it exists in your system environment and it, depend, and it expects libraries to be installed in user lib or something. And uh, it, it really takes a lot of work to sort of uh, coerce that stuff into this model. If you, if you have all your own code, it's a little easier because uh, the Bazel developers and Google has, has figured out how to like, make this work for C++ code and figure out what options you have to pass to, to GCC and stuff. The other thing is that you, it's really most useful and powerful when, when everything has sort of bought into this because then you have your canonical um, dependency tree encoded into Bazel. Uh, and, and you know you're not missing anything. Uh, and unfortunately, Bazel doesn't quite work on Windows yet. Uh, they're working on it. It's on the roadmaps. Uh, so this should be only a short-term limitation. Uh, and then specifically for Python, 
some things I've encountered are like, so I showed you how it will, it will yell at you if you have the wrong C++ dependencies, uh, but it do, that doesn't work for Python because um, it sort of works because if I don't include a library at all in my transitive dependencies of my application, my, Python, my application will just error out when I run, but it doesn't enforce the direct dependencies or I, I depend on only direct dependencies. Uh, so uh, where I work, we've actually built some static analysis which does, um, which does enforce that for us. Uh, and then the last thing is that uh, Python developers uh, partially use Python because it has a pretty fast iteration cycle and they don't really like building things like, this is Python, why are we doing that? Um, and you have to build some like automatic tooling to, to make that, the, the build step sort of, sort of disappear to, to disgruntled Python developers. Yes, the question is how do we, how do we uh, enforce uh, correct dependencies in Python since Bazel doesn't do that for us? Yes, we have a, uh, static analysis tool, uh, which looks at all the imports in your Python and then uh, uses Bazel query to find all of the files which you depend on uh, in, in your library and then checks to make sure that everything which you import you actually depend on directly. Uh, the question was that make file, makes, make is sort of a one-time batch operation. It has to compute the entire dependency tree before it's, it's able to do anything at all. Uh, and, the, and can Bazel do better? And the answer is yes. So one thing is that uh, the command line which you invoke Bazel is uh, actually a client for a server. So the first time you invoke the Bazel client, uh, it starts at the server process. Uh, and then the server process does all the actual work and it caches the dependency tree um, with, within it. So once you have that up and running, no op builds are, are done in less than a millisecond. Uh, so the question is, what about testing uh, and deployments, uh, things which people use Gradle for? Yes, so one of the things I didn't cover at all uh, is that Bazel actually has a test story. Uh, it, it basically treats um, tests as binaries which execute and return zero or one, uh, and that's whether your test passed or failed. Uh, so it, it, does, it does have a testing story, and the, 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 deploy, the deployment story is, is more or less like uh, you build this uh, sort of self-contained thing, and then you copy it somewhere, and you run it, and it works because it's self-contained, and it doesn't depend on anything. That's a very good question. The question was, uh, how does it treat the standard library and uh, site packages, so uh, third-party things. Standard library is, is considered to be part of the interpreter, so uh, when you're using Python, you sort of uh, implicit, like, as with C++, you depend on the, the compiler. With Python, you implicitly depend on the interpreter, and that the standard library is part of that. Uh, third-party things uh, from PyPI are, are um, also a really good question, and so at Dropbox, we, ha we actually have uh, uh, custom Bazel rules for um, downloading things from PyPI and inserting them into our build. And it, basically, we sort of like download them, and then we make a, a Py library rule for them, and so then those get transitively copied into our build. We don't, we don't want to depend on anything uh, in the system site packages except for the standard library, basically. We want to make our third-party dependencies hermetic, too. All right, thank you again. Thank you.